Welcome back to Unity Motorsports Garage. So I was encouraged to do a video on dual quad tuning by Uncle Tony of Uncle Tony's Garage. And so this video is going to be kind of like an introductory to buying dual quads, setting them up on your car to get you going in the right direction. I've done other videos about the tuning process, but today we're going to cover the basics like carb selection, whether to run a progressive linkage or a one-to-one -one linkage. Those are the things that we're going to talk about today. So stay tuned. So another thing you need to ask yourself is what type of engine are you going to be putting this on because that plays a huge part as well. You know if you're putting dual quads on a pretty much stock engine the requirements are going to be much different than if it's say a warmed up street engine or an all-out race build. So that's two completely different animals that we're talking about here. Um, let's talk about the low rise setups first. I'm going to put a picture up so you can see it of a Performer RPM air gap dual quad manifold. Now this is a good compromise situation here. but you're limited in the carburetors that you can run because it's set up for, of course, Edelbrock carburetors. The carburetor spacing doesn't allow uh, even a 4160 Holley, so that's something to take in consideration when you're doing this. Also, let's talk about carburetor sizing because there is a huge misconception out there about sizing carburetors for dual quads. You know, people think if you put two 600s on an engine, that's 1200 CFM. Well, that's not true. And the reason why that is not true is due to the pressure differential of above the carburetor and down below it. Think of it this way. If you have a 600 CFM carburetor, a one, on an engine, you're operating off of those four throttle blades. Well, when you effectively double that by putting another carburetor in place, the airspeed slows down considerably that goes through the carburetors because there's more surface area for the carburetor, I mean for the engine to breathe. So even though you may have two uh, 600 Hollies, that doesn't mean that you're getting 1200 CFM. In actuality, you're probably getting somewhere around 850 to 900 CFM because the engine is nothing more than an air pump. It can only digest what the engine will allow it to digest. Now, another topic that I wanna discuss that's not really brought up much is depending on your combination will depend on what kind of booster the carburetor needs in order for the setup to work ideal. What am I talking about boosters? When you look down the throat of a Holley carburetor, and I'll put a picture of a booster up right now so that you can see it, the style of the booster has an effect as how well the fuel is atomized as it's going into the intake track. If you're running a low rise dual quad setup, something that gets a lot of engine heat into the manifold, you want a pretty much a low gain booster. A straight leg booster or a regular down leg booster works really well. But if you have, say, an air gap dual quad set up where you've got air being isolated from the valley to the carburetors, the fuel needs to be atomized a little bit better. And so a step down lag booster or annular booster is the way to go. And on those particular manifolds, I would highly suggest the new AVS2 carburetors as they actually have annular boosters from Edelbrock. Really good setup. Um, all tunnel ram setups that I run, I really like to see a step down leg or an annular booster because you're pretty much force feeding the fuel in a straight line of sight from the carburetor to the back of the intake valve. And so the carburetor really needs to atomize that fuel as best it can so that you get a proper burn when it gets into the chamber. Uh, annular boosters will give you a lot more low-end mid-range torque than say a straight leg booster will. Up top the gains are kind of marginal because the airspeed in which the fuel charge is moving is pretty great 
but at part throttle operation, you can tell a big difference as far as drivability by having a good active booster in your carburetor. One other option we need to talk about is the low rise intake dual quad that is a single plane design. There's actually no separation of the runners. Both carburetors feed a common plenum. That's another option out there as well. Um, you've got the cross ram manifolds. You know, the low rise tunnel ram setups or street tunnel rams as Edelbrock referred to them as of the late 1960s. So when it comes to selecting carburetors, what do you do? How do you go about it? Actuality, if it's a stock type engine, you need to size the carburetors on the small side. And when I say small, 500 CFM, 450s, 390s in the cases of Hollies, uh, but definitely probably no more than a 600 CFM. And the reason why I say this is because low speed drivability does come into play, but you will get the added rush of having multiple carburetors up top. Now, tunnel ram setups are completely different. So, which leads us to the next question. The progressive linkage or one-to-one, -one, which is right for you? Progressive style linkages work really well on dual plane, dual quad setups. If you'll notice back in the late 1960s, anything that came with dual quads, most of the time that had a dual plane manifold, it had a progressive style linkage. The factory engineers were smart as they knew that this was going to give drivability and it was going to give you fuel economy and uh, the top end rush. This is achieved because of how the intake design actually works. You've got separated runners feeding different cylinders into engine. So basically one side of the carburetor feeds four cylinders and the other side feed the other four cylinders. With a common palantum manifold such as this tunnel ram right here, you see how all of the runners are tied to this common palantum. Trying to run a progressive style linkage on this type setup is a recipe for disaster. For example, most uh, primary setups, you would be running off of the front barrels of the back carburetor, okay? If you're running a progressive setup, you've got this common plenum, and you notice the angle in which the runners go down into the intake. It's a 90 degree turn. So for you to run a progressive style engine, uh, intake setup, the fuel would have to come through the plenum and then make a 90 degree turn. It would work really well for the rear four cylinders, but the front, the front four would be starved for air fuel mixture. In fact, you will run lean in these cylinders up here, causing all sorts of tuning issues. Something to keep in mind. From my past experience, I, every time I set up a tunnel ram setup, I always go to a one-to-one -one linkage. And that is so that I know that all cylinders are being fed the proper air fuel mixture. Even if you're running uh, a wide band setup in your car, it can be confusing because depending on where your pickup point is for your oxygen sensor, if it's downstream and you're not actually checking the AFR in individual cylinders, which 99% of the people out there on the street don't do, you may see good air fuel ratios on your meter but what's happening is it's being offset the rear cylinders versus the front and if you pull plugs out the plugs always tell the story when you run a, a progressive style on a tunnel ram you will see that these plugs back here will look dark and these up here will look like you just took them out of the box so keep that in mind one of the age-old questions when it comes to selecting carburetors too is vacuum secondary versus mechanical secondary. For most street driven cars with an automatic transmission that has say less than a 3000 stall converter, a vacuum secondary carb is going to do really well. A mechanical secondary carb, you know, 
I would save that if you're going to put a very high style converter in it, say 4,000 and above style, and you're running a lot of gear in the rear end. Because you're, with the vacuum secondaries, it will actually size the carburetor to the engine itself. So you will actually get the right amount of throttle opening in your secondaries at what the engine actually needs. Something to take in consideration. Now, when you do that on a vacuum secondary, you will have to experiment with the springs inside the vacuum secondary pot. And you will have to find out what your combination likes because it's driven by engine specifics you know a 302 cubic inch engine is going to have different requirements than say a 440 cubic inch engine you know the the amount of air that's being digested is two totally different things in those engines so you got to get the secondaries tuned to where you won't have the bog off the line when you map the throttle that is key to making it all work i'm going to show you a video clip of my friend and mentor David Vizar driving my truck Casper. I wanted him to drive my truck because he's a renowned author of automotive books and he's an automotive genius. And using his techniques is where I got all of this information from, you know, just through the years of him teaching me and now I'm bringing it to you. So we took my truck Casper out for a little drive one day and he was able to take off in high gear with my truck and it didn't stumble, it didn't buck or anything of the effect. And he told me that that was his grading system of how well a dual quad setup runs. If he can do that, it's about dead on perfect. You have to admit, when you go to a car show or anything else, there's nothing cooler than seeing dual quads on an engine. But most people, when they see that, they automatically assume that it's a poser, that the engine won't run. And that could be nothing but false. Because once you get your tuning down pat and you get your carburetors dialed in, you can have your cake and eat it too. This setup right here looks pretty radical. Two Holly 660 center squirters that were notorious for being race only carburetors. No one tried to drive them on the street, but I modified these things to where I was getting nearly 16 miles to the gallon with a 600 horsepower 393 Windsor. So it can be done. And that's with a loose converter and a lot of gear out back. It just takes time and effort and if you follow those things, you can have your cake and eat it too. So until next time, this is Andy from Unity Motorsports. Catch you later.